Hello, I'm Richard Lund coming to you from Los Angeles. Today I want to talk about a couple of things. They may not seem connected to you, but to my pea brain, they're connected. I am on a journey, a journey to live a healthy hundred years. Why not come along with me? Today we're going to dedicate this to two separate individuals who live far apart. One is Zhang Le Shi, or if I was from Beijing, I'd say Zhang Le Shi. <laughs> And the other is Dr. Jerry McLaughlin. Jerry taught me a lot of things, and uh, we're going to start out today with a quote from Jerry. But first, I want to remind you that this is for educational purposes only. If you're sick, please see a doctor. I am not a doctor. <laughs> Maybe you can find one that speaks herbal medicine. Let's go on with our story. The quote is, The Food and Drug Administration is protecting our health while they watch us die. Jerry McLaughlin, October 31st, 2003. I heard Jerry say that many times, but that is one time he definitely said it. I'm titling this The Chinese Plan for Pneumonia from a New Coronavirus, and Were the Jennings Six the Real Patient Zero? And Where is Huang Yanling? <laughs> so that, uh, that sounds disconnected, huh? So was Dr. McLaughlin being hard on the FDA? Or were his words reflecting the reality that South Korea had tests from Roche to use while we struggled to make a small amount of tests for a very low-capacity lab network and kept out the foreign products and even restricted our own states, universities, and U.S. companies from getting us the tests that we needed? We couldn't see the disease, COVID-19, so we were not able to plan accordingly to isolate cases. Instead, we went ahead with community spread. Live and learn, huh? No. We, or are we still restricting our people from an important herb used in China to fight this disease in as high as 90% of the cases in hospitals? Ephedra, also called Mawang, was used in treatment of people presenting with symptoms widely as early as January 2020. We restrict it from any supplements and from sale as a prepared medicine in the United States. Why? Because a Minnesota baseball player who was trying to lose weight sweated too much in the humid sun, summer weather, and he died. This is keeping us from using it to intervene in New York City today, where a thousandfold are dying without it. I obtained this document that I'll share with you today in Chinese from a citation on a paper I was reading and decided to just try to translate it with Google Translate after hearing a discussion from a Chinese government television channel talking about the use of traditional Chinese medicine, or TCM, in the treatment of COVID-19. One main point that was made in the program was that Ma Wang, or ephedra, was used almost universally in traditional Chinese medicine formulas to treat sick patients in hospital, but is highly restricted in Western countries. What I saw in the document supported the points made on this program. Here's a portion of the text regarding the use of TCM to treat patients. I'm going to be drawing this from the document that was issued by the Chinese government to the nation. I will note that the instructions did not say that these formulas were for the prevention of the disease. Mang Wang is not a preventive in my view or in theirs. Take a look at, with me. A Chinese medicine treatment, number four. So this is going after a number of other things. They talk about how to treat patients, how they present and what to do for them. But in this, this is the section on Chinese medicine. This disease belongs to the category of TCM epidemic. The disease is in the lung because of the epidemic. Now, the word epidemic in English was translated plague uh, on the program I listened to today. The basic pathological characteristics are wet, hot, poisonous, and stasis. Localities can refer to the conditions, local climate characteristics, and different physical conditions. The following schemes are used for syndrome differentiation. And then they say this scheme cannot be used for prevention. So, this is the guidance, the beginning guidance for using TCM or traditional Chinese medicine by the people in China. Number one, wet lung, 
So they, they give cl clinical manifestations, low fever or no fever, dry cough, less sputum, sore throat, tiredness, fatigue, chest tightness, epilepsy, or vomiting, loose stools. The tongue is pale or reddish with white or greasy fur and a pulse. And the pulse has to do with being able to read the pulse as a uh, Chinese doctor would do. Then they talk about what governs this. It's the detoxification of the lungs. And they recommend some prescriptions that are known by the people involved. And then they give a basic prescription. And the first ingredient is ephedra. The next part, evil heat lung. So they give their description and the, the basic prescription, ephedra, the first thing. I, I see other things in there that I'm familiar with, honeysuckle, forsythia, scutellaria bicolensis, which also is called um, uh, huang chin, and uh, so forth, and raw licorice, also called gansao. No? Some people have been talking about that online. A third one, a third condition. And here we get to the prescription. It, it doesn't start out with ephedra, but it just means that it's further down the line in terms of um, how much is going to be used. But it's still there, number five. And the fourth one they call closed and closed. And you'll notice there it's not included. But that's pretty interesting when you think about it. It was used for, they've said on the program that I listened to, 90% of the hospital uh, administration, I mean, the people admin, uh, in, admitted, I should say, to the hospital used this mahuang or ephedra as part of their treatment. So where do we go from here? Do we see real reform at the FDA or just a temporary bending to the pressure of public opinion and the heat brought on by the current president to get something for the American people? You know, you've heard about... Uh, Chloroquine, and you've heard hydrochloroquine, and uh, used with ZPAC um, as a treatment, and it was kind of given emergency approval. Um, I mean, this is this is uh, quite unusual. This is dramatic steps for the FDA, <laughs> and like I was talking about the Roche test, I think finally now it's allowed into the United States, but. You know, under any other circumstances, it would have taken months and months of work for Roche or whoever wanted to import it uh, for them to get the approval, you know. I, I don't understand uh, how that works. I, I understand that we don't want people selling snake oil to people, you know, but that happens anyway. I mean, think of coral calcium. You know, the late night uh, infomercials we used to see that ran... I guess I haven't watched television that much lately for the last several years, but I can remember seeing those, you know, they'd come on and they'd run for, seemed like an hour, two hours. And uh, all you had to do was buy coral calcium and your problems were over. And of course, I think I heard at one point that they were having actually dipped four different manufacturers make it because they couldn't keep up with the demand. But these were on late at night when the regulators weren't watching. <laughs> Does that make sense? Uh, anyway, let's go back to our story. So, um, I want to bring up the idea. We we spent money on studying bats in China, and we got the papers published from, with authors from the U.S. and China and knew that bats in Yunnan province shared a bat virus with villagers that was not SARS or MERS or any other known COVID human virus, it was published in 2018. I think the samples, if I believe, were taken in 2016 in October. It might have been 2015, uh, whichever. So here's our money trail. And the study was jointly fund funded by the National Natural Science Foundation of China grant to ZLS. I'll explain who that is in a minute. Oh, and the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases of the National Institutes of Health. That's where Tony Fauci works. I think he's in charge of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Or maybe it's, maybe it's some other group. I don't know. But I'm just saying, that's uh, that's pretty interesting. Uh, and you'll notice it says it's award number R01. And it gives a bunch of other numbers afterwards. Um, Dr. McLaughlin used to get R01 grants when he was at Purdue. 
at the school of pharmacy looking for things that would fight cancer. And he explained to me what an R01 grant was. It was the highest grant you could get. It was the one where you, you got a bunch of money and you could run a program for a while. And if I recall, he had R01 grants for nearly 20 years. Uh, so he, he got a you know pretty good funding. People who run research facilities have to be funded somehow. And uh, it is nice, uh, quite frankly, that the United States government would invest in, in the work of people like ZL S. I'll, again, I'll explain her name in a minute, um, but we'll go on. Uh, then there was another person mentioned to PD. Uh, oh, but wait, we have another one, United States Agency for International Development, USAID, Emerging Pandemic Threats, Predict Project Grant, number, and it gives it. So uh, that's to PD. So um, so I'm just saying uh, there's some folks getting some money here, doing good work for it, I, I believe, but they're still getting some money. So to decode the recipients, um, the folks who used our money, PD is Peter Daz Dazak, I hope that's correct, of EcoHealth Alliance, New York, New York. Uh, ZLS is Zhang Le Shi, and she is the uh, Chinese, uh, um, Chinese Academy of Sciences Key Laboratory of Special Pathogens and Biosafety, Wuhan Institute of Virology. That's the one that uh, all the conspiracy, conspiracy theories are talking about these days. Chinese Academy of Sciences as well, Wuhan in China, and she's the corresponding author of this particular paper. So, if, you know, if you had questions, you could write to her, and I've uh, got the uh, ZLSHI at wh.iov.cn is her email address. And LFW is Lin Fa Huang, Lin Fa Huang of uh, the program in emergency, uh, emerging infectious diseases uh, at, uh, in Singapore. So you can see what's there. So, Zheng Le Shi of Wuhan Institute of Virology heads up their virology group. So this study is called the serological evidence. So serological would be to do with blood. Serological evidence of bat SARS related coronavirus infection in humans that showed that six villagers from Jinning in Yunnan province showed evidence of the nucleocapsid protein from the SARS R CoV RP3. Let me decode that term a little bit. SARS is the uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome, which was a disease that came up in. 2002-2003, the little r there next to it is SARS-related, and then COV is, or COV is the uh, coronavirus, and the one that's called, the, the name of it is the RP3. So it's a bat virus called RP3, and the RNA was not detected in these six people from this, there were 218, there were 218 villagers that were tested who lived near a bat cave actually two bat caves. That's kind of cool, isn't it? Uh, they live near a bat cave. Um, but uh, I don't think this is a, a superhero show. <laughs> this is just an old man talking. So we'll go back to this. So these six villagers uh, were tested. They, the 218 villagers were tested, taking blood, and then they were interviewed. And the, the, uh, the six that tested positive for this, the RP3 nucleocapsid protein. Uh, that's what we're talking about. Now, if, well, let's go back to that for a second and see if I missed anything. So the RNA was not detected from the virus. Coronaviruses have RNA, single-stranded positive RNA. But the presence of the nucleocapsid was indicated that they had been infected in the past so I will call these people the Jinning Six. And this is a picture, this is an illustration by uh, Alyssa Eckert and uh, Dan Higgins. Remember this one is being, you've seen too many times by now. And they've given some little um, things, the E protein and the Yes protein and the, and the uh, membrane protein. But then there's another protein inside that's called the nucleoprotein or nucleocapsid protein. And this is, this is the protein that 
that wraps around the nucleic acid when it's in this traveling state. So what they found in these people, they did tests that and I went through the thing to understand how the tests and they, they make perfect sense. The presence of these proteins is still uh, showing up in these people and uh, in their blood after what period of time we don't know. But it indicates that if that protein was in them from the RP3 virus, which is a bat virus, then there probably was some replication of the virus in their bodies. And they, at some time, had the RNA in them and were making this. And they didn't necessarily report that they were ill or severely ill at any particular time. So we don't know how it affected them, how deeply. We do know that there are at least four common uh, coronaviruses that go into people that uh, which two uh, cause um, uh, head cold type uh, symptoms. And of course, now we know there are, or let's see, I've got five plus two is seven. <laughs> that's, my, that's my graphic crawl is seven. Uh, seven viruses that are in people including the new uh, SARS-CoV-2. So this was an, the RP3 virus that was in people. Somehow it had gotten from the bat caves to them. These were almost all farmers, except for a few students of this 218 people that were examined. And, uh, you know, it was likely that they were outdoors. They probably had some animals as well at their farms. And uh, who knows whether the, the bats flew around and dropped some stuff, <laughs> whatever bats. I was going to say guano, but I think that's what birds do. So I'm not sure what bats, but uh, saliva or, you know, who knows, tracking around their, their viruses and uh, got into these people somehow. So it made that zoonotic jump. <laughs> I how that I used to think that was pretty wild, but um, the, you know, the coronaviruses have that spike protein, which marries up with our they call it the um, ACE2 receptor on cells. And then uh, they, they just merge their, their little envelope, which is made out of lipids, in with our cell membranes and kind of just squeezes together and opens up and in we go. on We're off to the races. Let's see what we got to say more here. So um, let's go on from there. Were the Jennings 6 the actual patient zero for SARS-CoV-2? That would be a question. How? I don't have any evidence beyond the fact that they had a bat virus in them because I don't know how that bat virus compared with the virus SARS-CoV-2. And we don't have the actual RNA from that original virus in them. But um, so it's, it's a question that we you know could ask. And then we have to realize that if in order for bats to be studied, they have to be collected. And so there was collection operations at some point in these two little uh, bat caves. So was there a problem in handling the bat specimens that were collected over the last five years or so uh, that were brought to Wuhan to be studied at that particular institute? Uh, was there some other problem, uh, uh, maybe a, a different bat virus that jumped to humans to bring on this pandemic? So those are questions we don't really have an answer to but the main thing is is that we know it got into people somehow. Um, and there's some in interesting thoughts about when and how because of time of year. Uh, you know, was December the right time for bats to be encountering people in the wild uh, in Wuhan, which has a weather something like Chicago, I guess, in the winter? Mm, what, did, what do bats do in the winter? I guess they hibernate. So they're, they're always sleeping, uh, hopefully in somebody's, you know, belfry. No, what do you call it? Bats in your belfry. But, you know, bats do uh, hang out in in people's houses sometimes in their attic or in a, in a cave or someplace like that in the winter. So let's see, go back to this. Um, so uh, Zhang Le Shi has been accused of some misdeeds here and uh, her lab having some carelessness. So there are people on the internet who um, who have accused Zhang Lishi 
uh, being involved somehow in spreading this virus. And uh, and they've even gone beyond that. They've said that one of her people that was on her staff uh, was patient zero and uh, allegedly died. Now, this was this was brought out on a channel called uh, Lao Y86. Um, and uh, the guy who was on the channel refers to himself as Sea Milk. He's an American guy. I think he grew up in uh, either Michigan or upstate New York. I've forgotten. Uh, interesting fellow. I've been listening to his channel and learning a lot about China over the years. Uh, he and his friend, uh, who goes by Serpent Zeda, or Z-A, um, Z is how um, British speak for the letter Z in English, <laughs> or, or Canadians, I guess, call it Z, too. And uh, anyway, so uh, they have a, a real interesting approach to making videos in China. They, they got on their motorcycles, these two guys, and they had um, ways to talk to each other in their, their helmets. So we had a walkie-talkie. And then they would record the video and record what they were saying as they rode around. And uh, it was really fascinating. And they've done some excellent work to show us about China, to show us lots of areas of China, way more than most tourists get to ever see. But they lived in China. I think uh, Lao 86 uh, channels had um, sea milk <laughs> again. I, I wish I knew his name. I don't. And if I did, you know, I'd be happy to tell you. But uh, Seamilk had lived there about 10 years. I believe he married a, a fine uh, Chinese lady and um, they have had a child. And um, they live in the United States at this time, I think in California, where I live. And then the other one, Serpent Zeda, Zeda Serpent Zeda, um, lives, uh, Winston is his name. And uh, that's, a, that's a name, an ordinary name. Winston, um, uh, he also married. He married a Chinese doctor. And I can't remember if they have had a child yet or not, but they're, uh, they're back in the United States now. He was from South Africa originally. And um, his wife, again, is a Chinese national, or has been. So, um, you know, they they have their points of view. It's uh, kind of funny. The the Serpent Zede's um, wife, is being a Chinese doctor, is connected in her mind with traditional Chinese medicine and Western medicine, but both sea milk and serpents at a poo-poo uh, Chinese medicine. Now, there are cultural practices which may sound uh, crazy to us as we hear about them. They like to bring up the bear bile medicine, you know, stuff like that, and I, I get it, okay. But uh, I also, you know, I personally go to a Chinese doctor along with my Western doctor and have been taking uh, Chinese herbal tea that I've been making from my uh, the directions I've received from my Chinese doctor for the last, um, oh, at least the last three weeks, uh, drinking it every day as a, um, a preventive and uh, as preparation in case I do become infected. And we'll talk about that another time perhaps, but I'm just saying I, I have a high regard for traditional Chinese medicine, and I've certainly been benefited from it in the past. But I'm getting off track here a little bit. So, um, Zheng Lexie has been, uh, you know, in the, in the news uh, and in, in reports, has been accused of having some kind of malfeasance or a mistake or um, some screw up in her lab. And today I read about her responses. I mean, she she originally said that she had sleepless nights over this concern that there was something that had, you know, gotten loose or whatever from her lab. And, uh, and I believe her, um, you know, um, I, I just, uh, when you think about a, a person, I mean, these are not, these are scientists, people that have given their life to scientific work. Uh, she spent many years, you know, at least a, nearly two decades, I believe, working in this field, um, why would she lie? Why would she, you know, why would she cover up uh, if she, if, I mean, this is a person that's taken real, real risks, you know, when you think about it. Um, she has been a researcher who's risked her own life going into bat caves and taking a chance of bites and injuries that could have resulted in a very bad outcome for her. You know, I don't know her personally. I, I don't have reports from those who do, but just been around science people enough to know, to have a sense of a person. And uh, 
and her responsibilities and how she's taught about it. Well, this accusation came out about how there was this missing researcher from the staff of the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Uh, Huang uh, Yang Ling is uh, said to be missing and is named as patient zero by, by some people. Um, that's, a, that's a big accusation and um, I think they're basing it on uh, the accusations from a guy named uh, Botao Shao. Um, and uh, he says he has inside information. He knows people from the, the Wuhan Institute of Virology and that there's been this problem. And I, the real evidence that uh, Seamilk presented was that this person's picture and their biography their bio, their, you know, the things that I've done has been removed from the website, but the name is still there. Okay. Um, he also makes reference to a, a particular um, ad for a, a research scientist. They're looking to hire somebody from the West who speaks English well, also is a, you know, has all these other qualifications to work there. And it was listed at uh, coming out from um, uh, Lee, uh, Shiz Lab in on Christmas Eve, uh, December 24th, 2019. And uh, in the description of the researcher, she, it was said that uh, she had uh, discovered that, you know, there were new new viruses that were transferring into people. Well, when you go back and look at her published work that's available to everyone to read if we want to in English, um, that's, that's what she's seen. So, uh, you know, it's... I don't know. I mean, was it possible that she was aware? Because I know that uh, Ian uh, Lipkin had talked about being aware of something going on about the middle of December in China and then went to China in the second week of January, I believe. So it's possible that she had heard some things about some new new things and maybe wanted to add somebody to her staff. But you have to remember that, that these these scientific papers that are published, are, you know, they're based on re real research in, in the field or wherever or in the lab, and yet they had to be written up. And so uh, the one time I was in China in 2005, I went to a particular group in, in Tianjin that was working on uh, studying, uh, uh, you know, the natural plants. And I met a fellow who was an American who was helping them out, who was there, I, I think he was given a, a modest stipend, and he was just helping them out with their English. Now, if you had a person on your staff in, in China who was a, a native English speaker, they could make sure that the words would be put down correctly and that it would make sense to the reader, and they would be more likely to be uh, accepted for publication. I mean, that's, that's the near and the far, that's the long and the short of it. And so I understand why an institute would want to have some people on their staff paid for, you know, by the work uh, that could both do some scientific work, but also would understand it enough to be able to write it up and submit it. So I, again, I think that's a personal, perfectly reasonable thing. And the fact that this person seemed to be missing, uh, missing in action, and therefore, uh, you know, that she would be the one... Uh, well, anyway, I did find a couple of publications from this uh, this young lady, um, one one Yan Ling. So uh, in in the English publications, it'd be listed uh, Yan Ling Huang. So Huang is her family name. So she published twice in 2015. Oh, and but wait, <laughs> and now I see another, and she's listed first on this publication it's called um, Association Between Lifestyle and Thyroid Dysfunction. A cross-sectional epidemiological study in the Shi ethnic minority group in Fujian province in China. Published 30th July 2019. Hmm. Now, if anyone wants to, uh, you know, have a conversation about that paper, I've listed the author, the uh, corresponding author, and his phone number and his email right there. So, you know, go for it. So... It's a puzzle to figure out how we got a bat virus, you know, from maybe it was from a strain of horseshoe bats, maybe it was from another strain. If it was in the horseshoe bats from those caves, how could it go 600 miles to Wuhan 
in the cold winter season while bats normally hibernate. If the bats came from Wuhan, maybe a different type of bat, because they have bats that live there, they would still be hibernating in December. So whenever the zoonotic jump happened, it would make sense that it would be in a warmer season. Well, more study is needed, as they say. <laughs> so, well, let's think about things. So we've got ephedra that I think we ought to have available to us now. Uh, I'm, I told that we could buy, you know, the, the actual plant parts. And so I'll have to try to track some down in case one of my kids gets sick or I get sick or my wife does. Um, I wish we could buy it. I wish we could buy a standardized product that was made seriously. Uh, maybe we need a doctor's prescription, but, you know, that wouldn't hurt. Uh, it might help us a lot in this season, but I'm not going to wait for the FDA on that one. <laughs> I give up. <laughs> But, you know, maybe they'll think differently in the future. Maybe we'll have some breakthroughs. Uh, I think it's important for us not to attack scientists unless they're really of a Dr. Mengele kind of form because they are the ones that will help us in the future understand what our threats are. We are going to have more uh, coronavirus problems during my lifetime and as long as I live and you know it's important for us to understand them when they're coming when they're coming and we need to be prepared we need to be ready we need to have the right equipment in place on far away you know sentinel labs so we can deal with this i have to say that i think the who has received fair criticism but the scientists who work there are probably pretty good people so maybe we could you know get a hold of the people at the top and, you know, move them on to uh, to retirement and get better people. Am I saying old people shouldn't be in charge of things? Yeah, not necessarily, but let's do it better. I'm not asking us to abandon randomized controlled trials, double-blinded, but it can't be the standard for everything always. And there's a lot of things that we can't study that way. We can't study food that way. We can't study diet that way because it's just impossible to have the multiplex of things uh, involved and be able to prove one thing or another. I mean, you know, the people that are favoring eat plants or eat uh, keto or whatever it is, um, we're not going to be able to study that in, in that same way. We can't make artificial f food to fake people out to make a randomized control trial for them. But we can do is we know that sugar is bad for us. We know that we can only handle a little tiny bit every day. We know that processed food is bad for us, except in the pandemic. I mean, we have to have some processed food somewhere. But it could be just canned beans. It could be other things that are canned or frozen, just Make the food simply, and if it's got a big ingredient list, we could stay away from that. We don't need that. Um, you know, how many Cheetos do we need for this pandemic? Zero is the number. <laughs> Let's respect the scientists. Let's give Shung Le Shi a break. And uh, let's try to be kind with one another. Let's wear the mask we have not the best one that we can possibly buy. If we got a bunch of them, share them with your neighbors, share them with your, with your hospital. And if you don't have them, make your own. And, um, you know, we just gotta, we gotta do things proactively. We can't wait for the government to tell us that it's time to wear a mask. We look at, you know, we looked, we looked earlier, we made reference to South Korea and the United States. They had their first COVID patient recognized on the same day. Is South Korea in trouble today? No. They handled it because the people had dealt with SARS in the past, in 2003, and they knew what to do. They need to, they need to cover them, their mouths and nose when they're out. They needed to be able to stay home. And they knew how to quarantine. In the United States, I'm still getting people and I see on Facebook talking about how it's stupid and why they don't need to do this. And 
not that many people are dying and more people die from the flu and 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 so you know you, you've heard it i'm afraid that we're going to see our 50,000 flu deaths this year i'm afraid we're going to see our 50,000 flu deaths this year with a lot more people than that this has been a high a high number of people dying this year from flu but i i just can't imagine that we won't go way north of 100,000 from this COVID-19. And uh, I don't want to be one of them. Nobody does. So let's see what we can do. Um, it's coming up on Easter, coming up on Palm Sunday. For those of us who are followers of Jesus, remember what he did for us. He laid down his life for us. And perhaps it's time for us to... Su Suffer and, and care for others and do what we can. I want to wish you all peace and may you live a healthy hundred years. Mm -hmm.